That's right, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast with Beto and Millie Gudiño. Today we have a special guest, Jake Barrena, and we're going to be talking about authenticity and more. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, yeah. Okay, so... Milik, why don't you introduce us to how like did you meet our guest and maybe later on we can go into like Jake, like who you are and a little sure. bit of what you do. So Mili, welcome to the show first of all. Um, because it's great to have you. How you doing? Thank you, Vito. I love to be here. Um like excited, like you don't have idea. Uh like long time ago, maybe like two years ago, I saw him on Facebook. And mm -hmm. I saw like he was working out and pure <laughs> muscles, you know, like always throwing good um, motivation advice? words okay. or advice. Like, who is this guy? And then I saw that we were having friends in common. So I just friend him. Mm -hmm. And since then, I'm following him, you know, and I said like, oh, and he's kind of spiritual because he's praying, you know, I got you a little. Mm -hmm. So he got me more, you know. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So we were friends in Facebook and finally I reached out to him. I said, he have a new book, Beto. Ooh, and like, oh my gosh, you know, he's a writer, right? That's more, great. he's a coach. And oh um, yes. Oh boy. Yes. So thank you so much for accepting yeah. our invitation. Uh, it's so wonderful. I'm ready and prepared to learn more today about who he is mm -hmm. and what I can learn. So apply that in my life. Love it. Thank you, Mili. All right, Jake. Well, this is the time. Can we get to know you a little bit, like a little bit who you sure. are and what you do? Yeah, sure. I've been an entrepreneur for the last 18 years, 19 years. <coughs> I've been married for the last 15 years to my beautiful bride, Ashley Britt Barena. And then I have two beautiful kids. So Kingston James and Tinley Grace. So Kingston's five, Tinley seven, and they're everything. They're mm. my world, they're my heart. And then um, right now I currently own a real estate company called Barena Real Estate Group. We have a team of about 18. We do residential real estate in South Orange County, some North Orange County, kind of agents spread throughout Orange County. But I, I primarily focus in South Orange County, so Laguna Niguel, Dana Point, that whole area. Not really passionate about real estate, but I'm passionate about people. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I love helping people. It's funny because when I talk to clients and they, they say, you must really love real estate. You've done it for eight years. No, not really. Um, I love wow. helping people, though. So find a home. <laughs> And, but like real estate per se, you know, the, the structure of it, I don't care for that, but I love people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a natural fit. And I've been a salesperson pretty much my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I only like to sell what I am passionate about. I cannot mm -hmm. sell anything that I don't care Just for. like me. Oh yeah. yeah. But, but if I'm passionate about authenticity, um, helping people in some regard, I'm all about it. And I can just, mm -hmm. I could sell a pen. Um, wow. I could sell anything. So, um, but I have to be passionate about it, That's for sure. So I wrote a book this last year, which I'm really excited about. It took me about nine months, about two months to write the manuscript, which at the time was about 80,000 words. So that's about 300 pages. Um, but then through all the rounds of editing and cover design and the audio book, which is a huge thing, and that's narrated by me. Wow. Most people don't know that there's 11,000 books published every single day. Wow. So that's 11,000. 11,000 books. Wow. So that's a lot of content. And so with yes. all that content, um, one, one good way to stand out uh, above the rest is to have an audio book. Hmm especially an audiobook narrated by the author. Mm -hmm. Normally, um, out of the 11,000, there's about 25%, so a little less than 4,000 of those books have an audiobook. Mm. And of that 4,000, there's only about 10%, so about 350 that are narrated by the author. So mm -hmm. that's a very slim margin. And typically, it's more of a memoir, which makes sense with my book, because my book is, it's called Carpe Now, and it's about seizing your best life, but you do that through authenticity. Mm. And it's through diving into these 10 authentic habits. Mm. So a part of that, though, is, is the discovery process is you really have to chisel away at this 
falsehood of who you are. And in order to do that, the tool that I used was my life stories and my journey of discovering my, my authentic self. Mm -hmm. So I gave my life to Christ July 15, 2001, and it was a really radical transformation. And so with that, um, I use that story along with other stories. So when I gave my life to Christ, I, I was nearly bound for a straitjacket, and Christ redeemed my sanity. I was literally losing my mind. And it was this whole intense process. I overdosed on pharmaceuticals, didn't realize Vicodin. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I went through this 12-day, very bad experience where I was being taunted by demons. And um, I, I couldn't sleep. So when I would um, get in bed, I would sink into my bed with pitchforks stabbing me in the back, which felt like and these were hallucinogens. Mm -hmm. Like they weren't mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. happening, but it felt like it. Mm -hmm. And the, the demons taunted me. I mean, it was nearly believable as in like I thought it was really happening but at the same time it was just this really intense experience wow. where at the very end um, through a, a longer story which you gotta buy my book to know <laughs> but through a longer story uh, of how this came about I, I gave my life to Christ and within seconds he healed me and I took wow. me down this journey and this path of of discovery, of discovering my authentic self mm -hmm. and my purpose and my passion wow. and my selflessness and my growth and all these things attributed with that. So there's a lot of gnarly, intense yeah. stories in the book. Okay, so this is what this is what I want to start first. Yeah. Emoji tombola. <laughs> Divine emoji. <laughs> okay, so what is that idea? Uh, I, I mean, you can already said what the book is about, but if you would summarize like the hypothesis of the book under this emoji, what is that? So the hypothesis would be in order to seize your best life, in order to create a blueprint for your best life, which everyone wants to have their best, even if they have identified that or not. It doesn't matter if they have bad habits or good habits, people want to have their best life. They want to enjoy life. They want to enjoy the goodness of life. They maybe want to enjoy um, their surroundings, even if it's negative, they want to enjoy their best life. So in order to do that, you need mm. to discover your authentic self. But in order to discover your authentic self, you need to know what those authentic habits are and you need to eliminate excuses. Mm. Which a lot of people like we were talking about earlier going to the gym, they have excuses. Mm. I have parties and I have things that I have to do so I can't start now, I have to start later. So most people are waiting to start for the new year or for Monday, and it's not about that. It's about starting now. So that's the whole philosophy with Carpe Now. Mm. It's to seize the moment this very second. Love it. Mili, you wanted to ask something in relationship to that? Or what were you going to ask? Uh, you sent to us five minutes from your book. Oh, in that five minutes, you cover so much. Mm. You know, like in, in the lies of this world, but mm. I, I used to tell them on our Spanish podcast, people always say, and we say that people don't change, mm. never change. And, and that's a lie, mm, you know, and you good. was expressing and that's these five minutes that. The audio book that I sent you. Yes, yes, yes. Like it, oh boy, this is five minutes have so much content. Mm. You know, and um, I love to listen to Jordan Peterson, mm. and mm. I feel like you and him are aligned. Mm. I mean, they have been to the same message. Mm. That's and, good. And, yeah. And and, mm. and I think the Holy Spirit is doing something mm. yeah. through our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, like I was saying, I was sharing with you, like I'm having this depression, and and I don't have the energy, and my hair. Is uh, I'm losing my hair and all this crazy stuff. Like, I know that God put me on this path to feel like what other people is feeling too. Mm -hmm. And how I'm gonna get out of this season that I know I can mm -hmm. through the through through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. And this is a season that I'm gonna face, mm -hmm. and I'm I know for sure that I'm gonna get out of this, right? But mm -hmm. um. Yeah, thank you so much for mm -hmm. being a good listener to yeah. the Holy Spirit. Mm. Thank you, thank you. I know that um, that burning you have in you mm -hmm. 
you know, in, in the love for other people, mm. like you're not drunk, you know, people mm -hmm. who will listen to you that we are mm. there, we're going to yeah. have a better life and not just me. Like I was um, looking in LA, for example, all the youth and all this generation, mm. they're looking for something and mm. they choose this path of um, new attraction, that, Love the attraction. love attraction, the love secret, attraction. the new age stuff, new age the stunts. Yeah. Like everybody's living that life because they're looking for something bigger and better to have a better life. Mm. You know, but I, I feel I feel that um, it's that small line, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Because your book can sound like that. Oh, be careful! You know, mm. before I was so scared because I have an encounter with the devil too. Mm. And I was kind of lost, and it's so hard for me to identify what is good and what is evil. Mm -hmm. I was lost, and I walked with Jesus for all for all, already sixteen years, mm -hmm. and this happened like five years ago. Ma. Like it was hard, you know, for me to discern the good mm -hmm. and evil. But now that I follow Jesus and I have the Holy Spirit, when I listen to you, the oh, this is coming for my Creator. Mm -hmm. It's It's because I feel that the, the evil offered the same is the, the the copy of God in the Bible, you yeah. know, like that's a cheap copy mm -hmm. for what we are doing as a followers of Jesus. And uh, I can't wait to read your book and order it on Amazon. I have the link. We will post it here below nice. so you can get your book too. Yeah, That's so good. Okay, so there's a lot right there, but I think... What I'm, um, what I'm picking up, okay, so the, the main theme is like authenticity, mm. but also I feel like you've, personally, I feel like you, you have a lot in common, mm -hmm. and I think, I mean, you mentioned almost like battling demons and this like pitchfork, mm. and having these, um, I don't know, are they feelings? Like, could you describe that a little bit? Because I think you're saying you're in the pursuit of your best life. Mm -hmm. Right. So back in the days, what were you pursuing that was that best life, but also that at the same time you had like this demonic encounter? Because I feel like people could resonate with that, just like Millie said, you know, because mm. when you do these things, you know, the, the law of attraction, all those things, you're you're looking to be the best you that you can. Mm. Right. But you look like through these different methods or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but then you end up finding like, man, this is horrifying you know when night comes like i have these dreams or visions or hallucinations right mm. so if you could describe that like why is it that you were maybe pursuing or were you pursuing your best life back then when you were experiencing these things was that maybe in pursuit of your best life even though if, if it's the i don't know the worst case scenario to pursue that right through hallucinations because i always wonder why do people do things like that you know um drugs and what? drugs and and There's, there's gotta be a sense of like, I, uh, I like this, like it's, mm -hmm. it's offering me something, mm -hmm. right? There's an exchange of, of something that maybe it's short term, but I, I'm willing to go mm -hmm. right to that. So what was that like for you? Like that wrestling with, um, yeah, so it, it, that past maybe it was a similar motto that I had back then. So when I gave my life to Christ, I was 18. And that was the end of my junior year of high school, going into my senior year. So um, prior to giving my life to Christ, I wanted to live life to the fullest, but it was by whatever means possible. So it was a very selfish life. It was about um, doing drugs and getting that, that temporal feeling that you get from doing drugs and drinking and partying and all that. But if I really want to go to the culprit... And it, it falls back to me because I'm the fallen one. I'm the one that made all the choices, the sinful choices to take me down the path that I did. But it started with a broken family. So my parents got a divorce when I was two, and you were telling me about your family situation as well. My parents fell in love right out of high school, and they got married at 18. Wow. And they had their whole high school graduating class there, apparently, like 300. <laughs> they actually were um, pretty much born and raised in the Coast Mesa area. And um, they ended up um, having a great marriage for like 10 years. And then the last two years, my dad started to abuse alcohol. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just a Friday, Saturday thing. It was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday. And then it was every day. Mm -hmm. And then those last two years, from what my mom said, and I wasn't born then, so I, I didn't remember. 
but my dad just started to party hard. My dad's an incredible person, so he's a Cuban guy, very passionate. Um, it's very true what they say, that when you drink, you become more of who you are. My mm. dad just becomes fun-loving and incredible and wow. all that, but he would do things like, I'm going to take out, he worked for the city of Orange County. I'm going to take out the entire team, he was a supervisor, for um, afternoon drinks. Mm -hmm. And that would cost a few thousand dollars. My mom would be like, you know, we can't afford this. But he was just that kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And it just became too much. So my mom gave him an ultimatum, say, stop or get out. My dad's like, no, I want to get out. So he chose to leave. Mm -hmm. And so by the time they got a divorce, I was two. I was too young to remember. It was a long time ago. Mm So we were on the run for many years for my dad because my dad was in pursuit of my mom. Mm. He realized he made a bad choice, but he was still drinking like a madman, mm. pursuing my mom. So um, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of moving. And then finally, I got to live with my dad when I was elementary school. We moved to Big Bear and, and then Costa Mesa and Santa Ana and Garden Grove and all these areas. So it was just a lot of back and forth. My mom was kind of like the goody two-shoe. So I saw my mom as this kind of titan of positivity and this warrior for good. And I didn't really associate her with the church, but she was just good. And my dad was also a titan for positivity, oddly enough, but he was just a raging alcoholic. Mm. And so spending time with my dad was always of the greatest desire to me, but I just never got that. And I wanted and craved that relationship. And so I guess to a certain extent, I would look at my dad and just naturally I wanted to mimic him and he was just the cool guy. He was so fun loving and everyone loved him. So I'm like, I want to be that guy. And I didn't really think those things, but looking back now I recognize, oh wow, I wanted to be like my dad. Mm -hmm. So I became the life of the party. And so a lot of smoking, drinking, and that was junior high and then high school, cocaine, ecstasy, shrooms, all that. And with that, I, I was really good at a sport. It was skateboarding. I had some sponsors and I used to compete. And I had broke my foot and I went to the doctor and the doctor said, are you in a lot of pain? And I was like, a lot of pain, but I was in no pain at all. <laughs> but um, he, he gave me some Vicodin. And, oh, and, wow. And so I knew it was going to be like, sweet, got some drugs. So um, I was popping those things like candy. And I didn't know that the number one side effect of Vicodin is to hallucinate. I didn't know that. Mm. So I was popping them like crazy. Um, it was July 4th, 2001. We were sniffing some Coke at my parents' house. I knew my parents were going to come home. We had to bounce. There was like eight of my friends. So we went to this place called The Ditch. And it was a ditch that we would like graffiti up. And we used to rap. I used to be a rapper back in the day. Wow. <laughs> show us some Show us no, some of that. I come got on. Nothing. I got nothing. It was a long time. It was like 22 years ago. Wow. So my rap name was Digest the Best. So Digest yeah. the Best? <laughs> Wow, that's that's fun. <laughs> so okay. this was this was a thing that we would do. We'd go to the ditch and lay some raps. I had some friends that were beatboxers, were sitting there hanging out, and this is where it all started. I didn't again realize that I was about to go on this journey from the side effect of Vicodin. Did not know. But I'm sitting there with my friends and in my head I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make my hands melt together. Just odd. Odd wow. thought. Like who thinks that? But uh, And that was on no drugs to make me think that. Yes, we had smoked a little bit of weed, but like weed was a daily thing, and mm. it, it didn't really affect me. And maybe a little bit of alcohol, but we did that all the time. And by this time, I was an abuser of alcohol and drugs for five years. So we're sitting there. I put my hands together, and they melted together, and they turned into an A. And then neon green Christmas trees and Smurfs started to fly in the air. And I went like this, and eight of my buddies kind of looked at me, and my heart started to panic like this. But then I didn't tell anyone, because I knew that if I told people, they would look at me different and be like, Jake's losing his mind. Mm -hmm. So, and clearly, from that moment on, worst nightmare. So I was like... Because, because you said that was without the hallucination? So, like you were experiencing that out of the drugs, or because of the drugs? or So because of the Vicodin, but I didn't realize Oh, you didn't time, know? Okay. Because I was popping them like crazy. Yeah. I mean, I had just a short eight days prior, I got a full bottle. I don't know how many pills were in there, but um, a day a day prior to that, so within seven days, I had capped the, the bottle. The, the bottle was gone. Wow. So they were all consumed. And so I was at least probably having, I'm not sure how big the milligram dosage was, but five to 10 a day at least, going throughout my normal activities as well. So didn't realize this was happening, but clearly very evil thought, weird thought. And in that moment, Satan really kind of had control of my mind, where it was this 12-day, very intense, very descriptive, I, I couldn't even take the time right now to explain, but it's all in my book, 
of all the things that I experienced that night. I was terrified. So I asked one of my friends, I'm 18 Mm -hmm. and I'm this hardened, you know, 18 year old kid that had been arrested and in trouble with the law and expelled from multiple schools. And I'm terrified to be alone. And so I asked one of my friends, hey, do you want to stay the night with me? And without giving it the impression that something's wrong with Jake. So he's on my ground sleeping and I see all the posters on my wall start to swirl. And a few of them became crystal crystal clear. And one of which was the Imperial Eagle from um, Hitler, Hmm. along with um, a swastika. And so there was these very evil things Hmm. on my wall. And I'm like, what in the world is this? And then in that moment, I started to sink into my bed. And I felt like there was pitchforks. And then I felt like there was hands trying to pull me into the bed. And it was an experience where the walls were moving, the floor was moving. I was seeing demonic figurines taunt me and chase me and this was for 12 days and it was just awful that's insane yeah it was intense so evil because you can be on drugs and why not be in heaven right Mm -hmm. and have Mm -hmm. a good experience because for some reason people is taking this drugs to to be good and peaceful Mm -hmm. but this was totally the opposite yeah bad experience (gasps) yeah bad trip like you was living heaven i mean hell. hell Yeah, I mean, wow. I, the best way to describe it is if someone had taken hallucinogens before, mm. there is something called a bad trip. And when you're mm. in a bad trip, it's really hard to get out of it. Mm. So it's like a bad trip for 12 days, 24-7, wow. constantly. Wow. Okay, so out of that, um, what happens next? Like, how, how, yeah. how is that connected to, like, trying to still live your best self? It seems to me like that's kind of like the... I was not living my best self right there. <laughs> right? <laughs> But it's a... Uh, I mean, you said you're, you're saying um, your upbringing, right? Like you're trying to emulate maybe your dad right. and and that fun that he had, that coolness. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe the I don't know, like the the drugs weren't necessarily doing that. Did you feel did you feel like you were somewhat accomplished in in those times or no? No, not do, at all. Do you feel so, more like lost? Did you? No, lose? I was. I, so, in the beginning of my book, I describe what it takes to digest authenticity. In order to do that, it starts mm. with the introduction, which is to be present. And in order to be present, you have to be ready to digest some intense stuff. So you get into a present state, and so this could be through prayer, meditation, realizing. You ever read a book called Ragmuffin Gospels? Mm-mm. I've heard of it. Maybe I've read it, but yeah. So he does a really good job of getting people into a present state. And then Mm. the very first habit, the very first chapter is foundation. So I basically start the book off by saying I had a weak foundation for 18 years of my life. Mm. And that was a broken foundation and it was headed nowhere. And basically without Jesus, that's where everyone's headed. It's Mm. a weak foundation. And then I had a firm, then I have a firm foundation and that's Mm. in Christ. So that's Mm. July 15th and after. So basically at the very end of it, I'm losing it. I did not tell my mom the entire time what was going on. I finally, uh, my mom or anyone, But the reason I say my mom, kind of naturally and organically, she was the person that offered comfort and assistance. She's my mom. Mm -hmm. So I felt like at the end of the day, mom can help me. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, I was about to lose it. And it was day 11. And I asked my mom to pick me up at this skate park over by Laguna Hills High School. And she takes me to this church function, which she was surprised that I even wanted to go because it was like 8.30 at night. Back back then, I did home studies, and I was not the best student. I'd come home at like 2, 3 o'clock almost every night, partying, drunk, high, all that. So it was 8 o'clock, I think, on a Saturday night, and she's like, you want to come with me to a church function? That's weird. Okay, yeah, you can come. So my mom was tied in with the church, went. It was weird. People were lifting their hands, worshiping, doing – and I'm like, what is this? This is strange. And I left. And I'm out on the curb crying profusely, and I feel like I'm about to let it go, like I'm about to lose it. Um, It had, like I said, been 11 days to this point. Mom comes out, and she's like, what's going on? And I told her, and and, um, I said that these bad dreams, I was just telling her they were bad Mm. dreams, were really Mm. bad. And so she starts crying as well. She says, can I pray for you? She prayed for me. I didn't even pay attention. I was terrified. Next day was church. We went to church. And I said, I want to go to church. She was shocked that I want to go to church. We went there. And I remember the pastor was up on stage and he disappeared. 
I mean, he didn't really disappear, but he disappeared. And these prison bars appeared behind him. And I just felt like, okay, this is it. Like I am, it's 12 days into it. And it was, it was, it was a full blown spiritual war for 12 days. Mm -hmm. And I was in the trenches in the thick of it. So I go to the car, I am bawling. Mom gets in the car and I, I, I finally confess. And I'm like, mom, I think it's karma. I think it's caught up to me. Um, Life, life is now coming to a head because I've, I've lived a very selfish life. So my life was very selfish. It was all about me and living life to the fullest. And I would steal from department stores and trouble with the law, breaking and entering and all this stuff. And finally, I'm like, okay, this is it. My mom's crying. She's silent. And I'm terrified that she's silent. And she ends up saying, well, I have someone that can help you. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and so she's Christian. She went to church and I paid no attention to that. And I said, who? And she said, Jesus. And I remember going, let's go meet him. <laughs> like, I was just in another place. I legitimately thought we we're going to go meet Jesus. We're going to go meet Jesus, <laughs> wow. like a physical person. Yeah. And so she's like, no, it's God, and he can save you. But you got to commit your life to him. She gave me a 30-second little altar call. And it was, it was there was no real story attached other than he can save you. And wow. I was like, I'm in. Yeah, let's do it. So we prayed, and literally within seconds of praying, done, we're bawling, we're crying, um, there was this sense of confidence and this sense of peace and the sense of, yeah, I'm going to be able to do this. And so clearly, when you accept Christ, you're given His Spirit, and you're given a strength and a depth. So at that point, um, everything that I was seeing and experiencing, it went away within a second. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a times that Satan would still try to lure me in to not just the past, but the possibility of, hey, you know, you could still lose your mind, Jake. Mm. So, everything that I was seeing and experiencing, and it was intense. And it's, again, all in the book. It's very intense. It was gone in seconds. I was healed in seconds. But it was a few years of, in the moment of weakness at night, When it was quiet and no one was around, Satan would lure me with thoughts of, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose your mind for sure. So, I would have these panic attacks and I would have these spiritual battles, which are also drawn out in the book. And it was very intense. And so, that built a lot of toughness in me and perseverance. So, that's why I have such a strong, devout faith that I would go at any lengths to do what I have to do for Christ. Mm. And it's because of that season and what I experienced and what I went through. That's why the book has this authenticity and this genuineness because I I literally expose all of me in the book, Mm. everything that people would normally not want to expose, like all the deep, dark secrets. And at that point, I'm bringing everything to the light and it's it's given people an opportunity to do the same thing in order to find your authentic self. You really have to expose who you are, mm. which, you know, people don't do that. Sorry. Yeah, they want their best life. They're, they're, they're also not willing to do what it takes to get there. You have to go through a, a very tough, lonely road to get your best life, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, and it's, I think some power there when you confess your sins and who you really are mm. and you face it, I think God gives you the power to overcome that. You know, for example, I used to be an alcoholic and keep it in secret because, of course, your sense, you do it Mm -hmm. in secret, you know, where nobody sees you. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge power. Like, no, I'm an alcoholic. And that's how I stop people Mm -hmm. because they will drink, drink. Like, no, I have a problem in the past with the alcohol. And if I drink one, I want to drink, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's hard for me to stop. So, no. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I, your dad is still around? Yeah, now I have a good relationship with my dad. He quit alcohol about 20, wow. 22 years ago, uh, wow. 25 years ago, maybe. Um, it's as good as it can be. And it, by great, I mean that my dad is at a distance. He lives in Washington state. Mm. We still talk pretty regularly. Um, I think the feelings that I had when I was younger, like I wanted to be like my dad because I didn't really get the attention from my dad like I wanted. I put those feelings to rest in my early 20s because I always craved that intimate relationship with Mm -hmm. my dad, that close relationship. Never really got that. My dad's not also the most in-depth kind of guy. You know, he he kind of, he's an incredible person and I want to knock my dad, but he kind of lives on the surface to a certain extent. Mm. And um, I was just talking to one of my friends this morning at the gym. Um, I like to go deep quick 
and some people can't handle it, and mm. I'm kind about it. Mm. But um, like you know, the whole he brought up the whole. Okay, if, when someone wants to be authentic, they they take it that they need to be aggressive and assertive mm. and direct with people, and it's like, well, if you don't like my truth, then too bad. Um, and it, it, it really comes across very selfish. And I said, well, fundamentally, in order to be authentic, you need to be selfless. Mm. And that is one of the authentic habits. You have to be selfless. So it comes from a place of kindness and love and generosity opposed to some people take authenticity the wrong way. You know, there's this genuous, mm. I need to be me and not like you, and I need to bash people for what they believe and what they do. And even though I have strong beliefs, mm -hmm. um, I have such an eclectic group of friends that don't believe what I believe. They have different political views, different views in God. They don't believe in God, and I still love them. Mm -hmm. I'm still next to them, and they're still next to me because we have this common ground where we can be genuine about who we are. Why um, 10 and why not 10? 20 habits? Yes, that's a really good question. So it's it, it's not in correlation to like the Ten Commandments or anything like that. <laughs> but um, I I wanted to be able to really dive into what does it take to be authentic without an overkill of like, here's 50 habits. <laughs> it's like, well, this is really intense. And I think 10 is e even a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's the right number for actually being able to dive into the authentic you. The book works in a way that when you're diving into these habits, it can be chiseled away one habit at a time, but it can also be that like, hey, I know my foundation. Like mm -hmm. I know the core and the anchor of who I am, which that is, let's just say Jesus. Okay, that's great. So you have your foundation. Maybe you can skip that one and go to the next. There's still relevance in each each habit, but they work in a way to where you can jump to one or the other. You talked about fitness. So one of the habits is fitness, mm. especially within the Christian world. Like we have someone, and I don't want to name a name, but in our life, he's a, he's a spiritual man. He's an mm -hmm. incredible man, mm -hmm. but he's very overweight. He's like 200 mm. pounds overweight. So can you really be that spiritual if you're two, three hundred pounds away? He looks like he's about to have a heart attack. Mm. So that's not good. I know a few. <laughs> yeah. So um, at the end of the day, um, all the habits are all the ten habits are there for a reason. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, like uh, sorry, Greg Rochelle. Probably I changed your name. I don't know how exactly pronounce. Better always laughing because I change names. But that's he, yeah. That's I pronounce it well. <clears throat> Good? Uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> but it's pretty he, good. You know, he was Craig saying Rochelle? that one, yeah. that one, that he will do one every year. One new habit? One new habit oh. every year. Mm. So can you imagine? I've been doing that 20, I will not say a number. I don't remember exactly, but like 20 years. Mm. And if you think like in 20 years, 20 new habits, mm. it's amazing. Maybe. It's so good and, and can be... You know, just using the flaws, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're gonna, no, no cavities, because you're doing the work. Mm -hmm. It's so small things we can do and apply in our lives to change, mm. right? And, and do it for good. So, how hard was for you making this book? Like, in what time? Mm. You have your company, you have your kids. Uh, how? How you did it? Um, so I'm, I'm not limited by um, plateaus. I think that people believe in plateaus, and I think they don't exist. It's 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 more God's timing. God will allow things to happen mm. when it's His timing. Mm. And so I say that because before deciding to write a book, which was at the beginning of 2023, one I spent three months journaling. I've been journaling and spending time with God faithfully every day, and yes, I've missed days here or there for 22 years, a long time. So that is one key element, I think, to my life, is that I, every day, even if it's for 15 minutes, I'm like, God, I'm gonna spend time with you, and it's just, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna get into your word. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna meditate, I'm gonna journal. I hate to journal, mm -hmm. but I journal. Like, I do the things that I don't like to do because I wanna get where I wanna get, and that fundamentally is <clears throat> really changing the world. I wanna change lives for Christ. I wanna change lives for his kingdom and I want to impact people one at a time and the only way to do that is to start with myself. Mm. So I journaled the first half of 2023, do I really want to write a book? Prayed about it, thought about it and it was a big yes. Like, mm. yeah, I'm going to wow. write a book. I have no clue what I'm going to write about. 
And then I spent 30 days, about a month, putting together a framework as to how I'm going to write the book. And a part of the habits were, okay, if I'm, I'm very engineer-like when I create something, okay, if I'm going to create a self-development book, which I thought that's the angle I wanted to go, so a nonfiction book, uh, those are hard for people. They're hard to digest. There's a lot of people that don't like to read those books. So how can I create a novel-like book, in my mind, a fiction-like book in a nonfiction that read like stories, that, that, that mm. had a memoir-type feel, where it was like, oh, this doesn't feel like I'm digesting. Mm. Like, what? Okay, authentic habits, 10 authentic habits, that's intense. That also sounds, for some people, boring. Like, no, I don't want to do that. But I illustrate these crazy stories, like you what you nearly lost your mind. Okay, you ran a fifty mile foot race, twenty five miles on two legs, twenty five miles on one leg, you through eight thousand feet of elevation wow. on Catalina Island in January, and so that's in perseverance. Mm. So I took my life stories and applied them in the book. So then um, putting together a structure and then actually deciding, okay, I did something called mind mapping, which is where you sit down and you really figure out what are the broken record conversations I have with people, <laughs> along with other questions to get where I need to get with the book. And why is it that I meet, I've met hardened criminals that are literally gangsters, full of tattoos, dudes that are, I mean, they're hard. <laughs> and within... 20 minutes, 30 minutes, they're being vulnerable and mm. they're shedding tears with me wow. and telling me their life story. And I'm like, wow. what's, what's happening? But the, the, the only thing that I can think is that I'm extremely authentic with people. Not mm. to say I'm perfect. No, I'm uh, being authentic means you're very broken. So I'm very mm. broken. I'm a broken man. And so recognizing that brokenness allows me to be vulnerable with people. And all of a sudden they're, they're exposing themselves to me in the world and it's like whoa this is crazy mm -hmm. so it came back to authenticity and then chiseling away what would it look like and and then um honestly writing the book from start to finish was nine months and there was it was i was in a constant state of prayer meditation time with god and i know i did everything i could to glorify god in this book because even though it is so it's not per se a christian book mm -hmm. and that would confuse people Actually, mm -hmm. one of my friends, Ryan Mariello, uh, was a great friend of mine, he said it best. He said that um, books can't be Christians. He said companies, businesses can't be Christians because they're not going to heaven. <laughs> People are Christians. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's money. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So the book is not a Christian book. The book is for everyone and anyone who wants to digest it. But it comes from this place that I, on occasion, share very intently the truth of Jesus and almost altar call like and the truths behind Jesus and his resurrection and all that but at the same time if you don't want to believe that I still love you can you still not read this book and digest information that could still really help your life mm -hmm. so we'll see I know that Christians will like the book I think that they're going to like it but non-Christians will they give it a chance I don't know mm. we'll find out wow that's so good can you share one one day of Jake how do you wake up and how, how looks? Yeah, sure. So I typically, I don't set an alarm. So I'm blessed in that regard. I, I could just get up when I get up. Um, when I'm really, my wife knows, she, she laughs. Um, when I'm really excited about whatever's happening, which is, which is kind of like all the time, like 24-7, 365. <laughs> um, I, my standard go-to time, I, I get up at about 4 a.m., But um, some days I sleep in, and that could be at the latest 6 a.m. And if I, I, I can't sleep past 6, but if I did, I would feel worthless. <laughs> Not that that's necessarily true, okay. but it's just a feeling that I have. But I get up typically at 4. Sometimes I get up, though, at 2 a.m., 11 p.m. the night before, and I just start my days. So What? I get up really hard. I'm not even joking. <laughs> and you sleep and through the day? And you're young, you know, because yeah. I, I know that older people, they can sleep so long and they wake up pretty earlier. Yeah. But you're young. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm young. I'm only 40. So, but my go to time is four. I get up, I, I spend time with God. So, that is undebatable. Um, doesn't matter if I'm traveling, whatever I'm doing. Um, and I think what allows me to be effective in that, as I say, it's just, it's just 15 minutes. Mm. But really, 15 minutes turns into 30, 45, hour, hour and a half. It's always different. But I basically put my journal, my Bible, maybe another book, concordance. I start with prayer and I just go, where are we going? Mm. And I spend time with God. Um, and then I go to the gym. That's kind of like my coffee. So I work out every day. 
I don't take days off. Uh, it could be light days. Like today, I, I have a rule, and the rule is no more than 60 minutes in the gym. Mm. So I went to the gym, and I normally start with the sauna for 20 minutes, but I got caught in a very deep faith discussion in the sauna with this <laughs> random guy. Sweet. Wow. And so I was in the sauna for 50 minutes, and I was like, ah. <laughs> and I, I, like I had thermo on, a sweater on, <gasps> thermo pants, oh, sweatpants, and I was just dying. So I had 10 minutes when I got out. So at that point, it was like, I'm going home. I, I, I got to show up to a podcast. So, um, and then I'll typically, A, either go to work or take one of my kids on a date. I date my kids every week. So that's really important to me, mm-hmm. at least an intentional date where I'm like, hey, Kingston, we're going to go somewhere fun. And it doesn't always have to be spending money, but let's spend time together. Mm-hmm. Um I go to work, I have appointments, I do my normal to-dos. I try to get done around 3-ish, 3.30-ish with all that because my kids have jujitsu mm. in the afternoon at 3.30, so I try to be a part of that. And if I'm not a part of that, then I'll typically get home around like 4 or 5 o'clock. But it's, for me, it's appointments, it's calls, it's emails. I have creative time set aside where I call it my creative hour, where it's at least an hour where I'm trying to create something new. So I'm working on this... Uh, Bible study for you version right now, mm-hmm. and it ties in with Carpe Now, and so that'll probably be available in the next six weeks to eight weeks. So I'm trying to create always something new and in, in future books and future ideas. I'm always being an entrepreneur like I have been, and I've created twelve companies, and they're they weren't big companies, they were small companies, but I've been in business for a long time, I have this itch to always want to create. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm always just kind of creating things. And then I get home, I try to spend time with wifey and the kids and um, have intentional time where I don't have my phone on or around me. And then we we'll try to get to bed at a good time, like eight, nine o'clock, and then start it all over again. I don't have the typical days off. Yeah, (laughs) I don't have the typical days off. I don't. I don't do like weekends off, like Saturdays and Sundays. To me, Uh Sunday is like Monday. Monday is like Saturday. Like every day is go time. Let's go. Yeah. Um, I always tell people, which they don't get it, and maybe you might get it. Maybe your listeners might get it. But I work three sixty five, and then I also take off three sixty five. So I rule my schedule. So I take off days and times and periods than that I want and I don't have my phone on me. My phone's right there. It's away from me. And then I have uh, days where I'm like go mode, like boom, let's go. We're crushing it. We're killing it. So, yeah. Wow, that's intense. That's yes. a good example for us. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. No, thank you for sharing. Man, uh, there, there's so much in what you've said. And, you know, thank you for sharing your story. And for sure, you know, people want to, like, go deeper into the story. Like, go read the book, Carpe Now. Mm. And, um, I mean, I love how you wanted to put the book into, like, kind of like the nonfiction, fiction Round right because P- people understand stories right and if you, if you think how jesus spoke it says you no know, the bible says that he always spoke in parables so it's mm-hmm. like wow mm-hmm. there's so it's so important because Power. stories are are powerful and are memorable right like we remember things but also i want to commend you because i mean one writing a book and listening to the spirit and putting it out and all the work and like you said i mean you have a busy and not busy um <laughs> life <laughs> Right, as you just said, but but also I think what I love is that I think you found authenticity, and I love the idea of persuasion, mm. and I think that's why so many people want to write books. Right, you just mentioned at the beginning of the episode, like eleven thousand new books a, a day, day published a day. I mean that's that's massive, but I think it's because humans have this desire to persuade mm. one another, right, and to tell stories and to say this story that I'm telling you matters, right? And whether, uh, mm. like you're saying, you know, you hang out with people on different political spectrums, and I think we all have, you know, friends and family who might align differently than we do, mm-hmm. um, and they're still friends and family, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think just the idea of persuasion and to trying to say, can I live a life so impactful that maybe through a book maybe through like you witnessing my life you might be persuaded to being authentic yourself mm-hmm. right and to be vulnerable and i think you found so much value in in that principle of authenticity and like you say maybe having coming from a broken foundation uh to a firm foundation and i love that you mentioned christ right but also in a sense i think pe- even people without 
Christ, I think the idea of having a firm and a non-firm foundation, I think it's understandable, mm. right? I come from a broken path. Okay, that's something anybody can relate to and understand and 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 see. Okay, yeah, I want to check this out because I come from you know, a broken family background or you know my dad was alcoholic or my dad wasn't home or you know whatever it might might have been but coming with the maybe i don't know maybe i think when people pick a book i think it's because we want to be in a sense persuaded by it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and maybe the book speaks to us or maybe it doesn't mm -hmm. but i think the cool thing about like even being sitting down with you right now is like we get to know you and the heart behind maybe the book right and i yeah. think that's ultimately what a book is is like who is this person and what's their true intention mm. yeah in writing right so that's where i, I all that to say you know i want to commend you for taking that step and for wanting to persuade people mm. and say you know be your be be you authentically and even to recognize because you mentioned this to recognize that being authentic Mm. there's a I don't know how you would phrase it and maybe you can do this right now right but mm -hmm. it seems to me like you're saying there's a right way to be authentic because also there's a deceiving way to be authentic mm. and that's that's almost paradoxical because <laughs> authenticity is basically saying this is yeah. truth mm. but you're saying that the truth you're living can be a lie or can be deceitful yeah in mm -hmm. a sense so can you speak a little bit more into yeah into maybe how you differentiate like an authentic vulnerability or authentic yeah. self versus... So, so just hearing you, I think that there's two questions that you have to ask is... <clears throat> so I know a lot of people that are authentic. So it's, are you authentic? And they're like, yes, I'm absolutely authentic. And I, I would say, I agree. But then the next question is, are you living your best life? Are you happy? Are you content? Are mm -hmm. you fulfilled? Are you pursuing a mission that gives you a passion and an aliveness to not just like your life, but like every day, every moment. Yes, there's moments that I feel, you know, bedraggled and beaten up and, and I, I need to maybe, so I have this guy in my life group and I love him, but he, he sarcastically, and it, it's fine, it's sarcastic, but he's like, he's like, Carpe now, right? Carpe now. <laughs> and I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> but he's, he's said it a couple of times in regards to um, me relaxing. And he's like, is that a carpe now life? Yes, it is. Because in moments, that is carpe now. You need to seize that moment. And sometimes that moment, God is calling you to rest mm. Mm. and chill and kick back. So I think, I think with to answer your question, it's, okay, are you authentic? Okay, maybe you are. But is that authenticity giving you fulfillment? Mm. And so maybe it's not. And if it's not giving you fulfillment, and if it's not giving you an excitement about life, then maybe you need to refocus that authenticity. Maybe it's not the authenticity that you want. Mm -hmm. So because a lot of people are they're struggling. They're they're not only um, financially and physically struggling, but they're emotionally and spiritually struggling. There's mm. people that seem like they have it all figured out. They have all the money, all the cars, all the nice things. Mm. But then they they inevitably end up killing themselves or mm -hmm. just doing these atrocious, awful things. Mm -hmm. And I don't really per se believe there are bad people. Mm -hmm. God has not designed bad people. He's designed perfectly created people, but they're fallen people. And these fallen people make bad choices. So they take themselves down this path that is unfortunate. And we're all capable of taking that path. Mm -hmm. And at, most people believer or non-believer would not battle this one which we all have freedom of choice and you have the choice to choose your life mm. so you either choose uh, the right path or the wrong path and fundamentally for me I've, I've always wanted to be like David from the mm. Bible right? I wanted to be like Job I wanted to be someone that at the end of my life I was just telling my wife this last week that I'm literally crawling to heaven and I'm and I'm and I'm tired and I'm mm. drained and I've done everything I could and God's like Whew, that was intense. You just did it. Wow. A opposed to like just, you know, doing some good. I don't want to just do good. I want to do my best, whatever that is. I don't know what that is, mm. but I know I'm just going to do it. And so people have told me I had some epic fails in the past. Mm. Businesses that have failed. And I think people thought that, oh man, Jake's broken. And I think to their surprise, they're like, how's Jake not a fuck? How you did it? Yeah, I, I just, I honestly, How? I honestly, I, I don't, I don't put, 
I don't put all of me into that company. Or mm. if my book tanks, like there's 11,000 books that are published every single day. <laughs> the lifetime uh, sales for uh, a book, the average lifetime sales is one to 300 copies. Lifetime. One to 300 copies. But I want to be a bestseller. And I don't want to be a bestseller because I want to make money because I don't lead with making money. Making money is nice because I got to put, support my family and, and my community and my church and God and do all that. But I want to be a bestseller because I want to impact lives. Hmm. And to be a bestseller, you got to sell about 10,000 copies on a given platform in one month, 30 days. So if I don't do it, it's not like, like people in the past, like, Jake, man, sucks, right? And it's like, no, like I've already moved on. I've been doing this now for 22 years, grinding for Christ. And by grinding, it's a good grind. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, it's like, hey, Jake, you work so much. And I do. But work to me is my passion. Mm. And work is I lead with helping people. How can I serve and help people? Like, That's who like you real are. Estate. Like, I mm -hmm. don't like real estate. But I love people. Mm. So I want to serve people. And so I'm going to keep grinding till the day I die. I don't care if it's, you know, today or uh, 100 years from now. I'm going to keep going until uh, I cross the finish line. And God's going to be like, whoa, you did it. That was intense. Yeah. I can't believe. And I want my kids to see that. I want them to see that legacy so that mm. they then can carry. Mm. That, that is a huge thing for me. Legacy. Legacy wow. specifically in my children mm. where they're like, wow, this, this guy, my dad is was a titan, as in he did everything he could. And I might not make it to like the David Goggins status or like someone that's well known, that's okay with me. But as long as I did everything I could do to assist people, help people, love people, give back, hmm. which which I, I feel called to, so. so I good. think we're all called to do that, <laughs> yes. yes, right? Yes, we, we are. Because mm -hmm. we are Jesus <laughs> apostles. And if we don't do that, so that's when we're gonna leave hell. Because you're not doing nothing for the kingdom when get, when God gives us everything we need yeah. to work for Him, right? And I think that's what happened to me. Mm. When I'm not working for other people or doing things to help people around me, I'm like, if I'm not here mm. and I decided to don't come, like I feel like I'm 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 doing something so bad and weak and mm. and depression. So. I know it's hard for me sometimes come and do when I'm not feeling good. Mm -hmm. But then I get out of here with so powerful, like, mm. yes, I did it. And God used mm. me. And, you know, and if I'm going to struggle, God knows what's going on. But I, I have his power. Mm. And he's so inspired to hear your stories because Beto and I, we we have so many failures in our lives too, mm. you know, with businesses, mm. with the podcast, yeah. we, how many podcasts we had <laughs> in the past? The, like, <laughs> this is, this is like attempt number 10. And again, yeah, and like again you know, and, and I ask God, God open doors, close, close doors. And, and the devil always, um, wants me to believe that I'm poor. Mm. So for me, the money is being an issue in our lives. Mm. You know, I, re um, I was raised, raised in Mexico, and I was poor, right? Mm -hmm. I was having everything, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm here, and we are illegal. Mm -hmm. So fighting with this legal process is taking us like seven years already. Mm -hmm. They denied twice the wow. government. We are in a third case, and and it's it's a battle. You know, it's hard. Like and and I love it. We're trying to do our best for. To don't to don't be a burden for this country to work, you know. Betu's Betu's been working here at the church for already seven years, and I work at the district for free, representing to the um, English, I mean the ESL, the English you know, learners. English learners. I did it for four years, giving my time. You know, I try to to participate in whatever I can. At my church, at the school, at my community, you know, with Love Costa Mesa and help my neighbors and working hard, you know. But I love what Dr. Jordan Peterson one time say, like, to be poor, it's not about money. Mm. If you have opportunities in this life, mm. you are rich. Mm -hmm. And that transforms everything inside of me because my son is going to... Um, Christian school is mm. called Pacifica, mm. the best high school in Orange County, mm. you know, and um, we had a, a scholarship, 
Mm. We applied for financial aid, and he he they accept him. Cool. And everybody Amazing. around us, like I didn't tell them, and they came over. I hear that your son is going. Congratulations! And they see we are rich to be here in this country in this beautiful bubble. We are rich. So many people in other countries, they're really suffering. Mm -hmm. They have no food and they're living in world, world. And, um, oh, they don't have Jesus, mm. right? But they, it is this con continue fighting with the devil. Like, you're poor, you don't have a car, you don't have that, you don't have that. And, and it's hard. Like, sometimes I believed him. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the exercise of to be, I don't know, some power comes to me. I think it's more serotonin, serotonin, serotonin in my brain. Serotonin, yeah. <laughs> when I'm exercising, mm -hmm. you know, and when serotonin. I'm not, and when I'm not, like, mm, that <laughs> yeah. weak. Yeah, it's all connected. Yes. Okay, that's so good. Uh, we're going to kind of like come to the close with... We're going to go back to the emojis, okay? So <laughs> this is what we do to finish the episode. Blasphemous emoji or blasphemous idea, okay? So according to Carpe Now, what is the worst idea you can think of? As people, you know, are, are thinking about grabbing this book, what is the worst idea you can tell them? Avoid this idea. So like a mistranslation idea. from the book? A uh, what? Like a mistranslation as in like they take Carpe now and they're doing the wrong thing, you're saying? No, whatever. Whatever you think is the, the worst idea, you can tell anybody that's going to pick up the book. Maybe when you grab this book, it's like this is the worst. Like don't, don't even grab this book if you have this maybe mindset. Okay, so I would say the worst idea is to apply the book unauthentically mm. and to... <laughs> to uh, not not take in each habit like we talked about is to be authentic by being real or being candid or being hurtful or being unkind to people mm. that is that's wrong that's the worst idea that not makes sense good. <laughs> all right i love it okay the next one is skeptical emoji <laughs> Where do you see skepticism played out when it comes with to... With that face, please. Yes, with that <laughs> face. When it comes to Carpe Now. I would say the doubt. Doubt. Yeah, a little closer to Mike. Doubt of God's existence and Jesus. Mm. I'm pretty clear that I'm calling out Jesus as God. Mm. So, there's going to be skepticism there. Love it. Okay, the next one is inspired. So what are you inspired by or where do you see inspiration? I see inspiration in my kids. Mm. I see inspiration in my wife. She is so different than me. Well, and I'm inspired by that because she's just not like me. Someone even asked me this morning in the sauna. I was like, man, it's incredible that we found a life group just like five months ago. This was a prayer request of my wife's. She's over the moon. I'm really happy for her. And they're like, so your wife's more social? And I'm like, no, not at all. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I'm mentor. more social. Well, um, so we're just so different. And I love that. I've just grown to truly love and cherish the fact that she is furthest from me and I'm furthest from her. Hmm. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So what's a holy idea according to Carpe Now? Holy idea yes. is that in order to seize your best life, you need to digest these 10 authentic habits that mm. are in that book. You need to chisel away at the falsehoods. Mm. You need to get past the layers of lies that people have been told mm. about themselves in order to truly discover their best life. So good. Okay. And last one. Divine. Divine. Divine emoji. What is the highest idea according to Carpe Now? The highest idea, that one's simple, is that Jesus is God, is that mm -hmm. Jesus is alive, is that Jesus did live, and that he was buried, he was crucified, he was buried, and he rose from the grave, and that he is real. 
and that he's evident in the lives of those around us. He's mm. evident in my life. He's evident in your mm. life. He's evident in your life. He's evident everywhere. Even if you don't look at other people's lives, you can see the evidence of Christ in creation, in the mountains, in the snow, in the weather, and these things that are just not to be explained. The human body is so intricate, that alone just mm. blows. How is it that people are confused by God's existence, yet people would also recognize that they probably know less than 1% of all knowledge, just mm. all knowledge, all wisdom, all understanding. I have some friends that are PhDs, highly educated, and in their particular field, they're like, I know so little about my craft. Mm. Wow. I mean, literally less than 1%. I know so little about the human body. I'm talking about surgeons and doctors and these individuals that are so educated and they're so smart. They know so little about their craft. So how is it that we can't look at God and go, he knows so much more than mm. us. He's, he thinks so beyond us. We're just in this like little bubble, this this globe, this mm. earth, trying to do our best. And we know so little. So, so God is real. God is evident. God is there. Um, and we'll find out when we die. Mm. Love it. Okay. And that's how we end the episode. Woo! High fives all around. Wee! <laughs> there we go okay Jake so uh, plug your book we'll have the show notes I'll put this on christianpodcast.com okay. but where can people go find the book or find you more about maybe where you know a little bit of what you do right? yeah sure so the book was just released last Friday um context what are we in we're in february <laughs> yes. so it's only been out for about eight days and you can buy it on amazon paperback or hard copy which you're going to have the link associate or you can go to my website which is jakebarena.com and that has access to not only the hard copy the paperback but the audiobook it's going to be available in about two weeks that's narrated by me and there's a lot of ad lib in there so it's different than the actual hard copy wow Um, and then the ebook is going to launch on Kindle and all major digital platforms March 5th. So you can just go to my website, jakebarena.com, and that's that's uh, full access to all my socials and the book and all the fun stuff. That's Love amazing. it. Thank you so much, Jake. This has been amazing. Thank you, Millie, for this special episode. Thank you, you, for listening, for watching this show. I would love to invite you to give us a positive review. If you made it all the way to this point, why not go the extra mile and give us a positive review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can find us now on YouTube Music, which took over Google Podcasts. It's now YouTube Music and a YouTube channel, or you can visit us at christianpodcast.com and click on your own emoji, you know, see how the world's doing with their belief meter right <laughs> from blasphemous to divine so thank you so much jake this has been fun and wonderful yes, experience getting to know you a little bit more thank you thanks thank you thank you thank for you. everything you are giving us today your it. time thank you. Thank, you. Cetera, really cetera. thank you thank you Beto. Boom, boom, boom. there we go mm-hmm.